So back to, to the hemoglobins. I'm going to finish up uh, our first session, and then we'll switch to DNA sequence variation. But they're all very closely related. So you get the basic idea of the thalassemias, quantitative. Uh, um, you, you've got not normal beta globin or alpha globin, just not enough of it. Not enough alpha globin, alpha thalassemia, not enough beta globin, beta thalassemia. Different mutation mechanisms. We've learned a lot from all that. Well, let's talk about the qualitative abnormalities. Here is where the protein is made in normal amounts, but it doesn't function properly. And again, you know, when you look at other genetic diseases, you're going to see quantitative and qualitative forms. Some of them are due to just simply losing the protein. Some are due to one that has a unique functional abnormality or functional property. Most qualitative abnormalities where the protein doesn't work right, most, not all, but most, are due to a single amino acid change, where we take one of the amino acids of the protein and we substitute another one. Well, this is the uh, alpha and beta globin genes. This is a very outdated slide. I've just never had the energy to update it. Um, <laughs> it shows you in color each of the amino acid positions at which a substitution has been found in a person. This is way out of date because if you did now, every single position would be color. At this time, we made this 10 or 15 years ago. There were still a few positions where no substitution had been found. But again, the basic message is anything that can go wrong will. As we'll talk about, somebody asked me about at the break, there are new mutations all the time. Each of us has about, on average, about 70 mutations that our mom and dad didn't have. New mutations are always coming up. And so, you know, you're going to eventually hit everything in the genome. Uh, and uh, if you look hard enough. And eventually we will look hard enough. Eventually we will have everybody's genome. And then I guarantee you we will know of someone out there with a change at just about every position you can imagine. So many, what can happen when you change a single amino acid? Um, and we're going to talk a little more about the different types of mutations in the next lecture. Uh, but basically, if you change the function of the protein of hemoglobin, you can screw it up in a bunch of different ways. A lot of the variants, actually most of them, nothing much happens. The protein works just fine. It's a neutral variant. They just have a slightly different uh, um, amino acid. It turns out in the early days, before modern molecular genetics, there really wasn't all that much you could do in the lab. But you could get hemoglobin, and you could run it on a gel. You could do hemoglobin electrophoresis. And blood was so accessible. People would do this all the time. And you would find, oh, look at that. This person has a band that runs funny. And then they would figure out what it was. And it was usually a single amino acid substitution. And many of them were totally silent. Um, some of them make the hemoglobin very unstable, uh, and it you, ends up often destroying the red blood cells and causing anemia. These are called unstable hemoglobins. There are some that get uh, oxidized abnormally. Uh, there are two very interesting classes, of, and you don't have to know the details. Just know that they're, you can get funny stuff by changing amino acids. But you may encounter some of these over the years in clinical practice. Maybe a little bell will go off. I remember hearing about that. And then you go read about it. Um, but there are, are people who have a mutation that makes their hemoglobin have a slightly higher affinity for oxygen, holds on to the oxygen stronger. Well, you think that might be good. It actually turns out it's not that great. The body thinks it's not getting enough oxygen because the hemoglobin doesn't let go of it. And they actually tend out to have high, elevated hemoglobins in hematocrit, polycythemia, because they're trying to make up for not dispensing the, the uh, hemoglobin well enough. There are those who have a lower affinity hemoglobin that lets go of the oxygen a little better, and they often are mildly anemic. And then there are these two, and that's what I'm going to talk about for the next about five or 10 minutes, uh, hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C. And these are by far the most important. Uh, the number of patients affected by this are orders of magnitude more than all of these added up together. These are very important genetic diseases, one of the most common human genetic diseases to know about, and we'll talk about why. Hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C. And again, this is the first a human disease understood at a molecular level. And I should also say, and I'll probably come back to this in my last lecture, to me something I, have, as a physician, as a physician scientist, have always found profoundly humbling, and uh, uh, as a physician, how little we've been able to do about this. So sickle cell anemia is a very common disease. We've understood it again at the two angstrom level from crystal structure since 1956. Yet the treatment of this disease has barely changed since. Uh, so, you know, you'll pick up the newspaper and read about how we just discovered a new gene and the cause of this disease and the cure will be around the corner tomorrow. It's not so simple. Uh, and, and it's not some diseases we have made great progress. But finding out the cause of disease, we're really, really good at that. Figuring out how to reduce that to a, a treatment is not so simple. So, uh, 
What this is, is a, a nucleotide change that takes amino acid 6, glutamic acid, and converts it to a valine. That's sickle cell anemia. Normally the sequence is GAG. You take that A and make it a T, and you have GTG. GAG codes for glutamic acid, GTG codes code for valine. Uh, that causes, that's sickle cell anemia. That's it, right there. Then there's this other curious thing. It's called hemoglobin C, or beta C. That's a mutation in the same codon, but instead of this A, it's a mutation in the G to an A. So you have an AAG, which encodes lysine. Same codon, different amino acid change, fairly similar but different disease. This is hemoglobin C, and that's hemoglobin S. Okay. And again, this is what a hemoglobin electrophoresis looks like. It's, it's done sometimes in the clinic, less than it used to be in the old days. This used to be the standard uh, diagnostic tool. Now we do these things genetically, just by looking at the DNA. But hemoglobin A would run like this on a hemoglobin electrophoresis. Uh, hemoglobin A2 runs here, so uh, um, you, know, you see a little hemoglobin A2 in a normal person, but it's 1 or 2% of the hemoglobin A. And sometimes uh, they're not showing it here. You can pick up a little of the hemoglobin F in a normal person. Uh, hemoglobin C runs down here. Hemoglobin S runs down here. And you can see here's somebody who has predominantly S. This is an individual with sickle cell anemia, two copies of S. Here's somebody who has, um, who's, uh, has C trait, one copy of A, one copy of C. And here's somebody who's got one copy of C and one copy of S, a hemoglobin SC disease. Um, the basic problem with, with both hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C, but predominantly hemoglobin S, it actually carries oxygen just fine. And it releases oxygen in the tissues just fine. Um, the big problem is that in the deoxygenated form, when it gives up its, its, its oxygen, it likes to form crystals, uh, these precipitates. It actually makes these long polymers that, that precipitate out of solution. Uh, and this causes the red cell to adopt a really abnormal shape which looked to somebody years ago like a sickle that you use on the farm, and that's why it was called sickle cell anemia. Um, when, once this red cell got back to the lungs, got oxygen again, then the hemoglobin went back into solution and it would pop back to the normal shape. Uh, so each time it's going through the circulation, it's collapsing and expanding. Uh, these collapsed forms don't flow properly. They can plug up blood vessels. And they end up blocking blood vessels in various places and causing what we call vaso-occlusive crises. And that's where most of the pathology of sickle cell anemia comes from. Uh, this is what uh, uh, sickle cell uh, looks like. A very common misconception people have is that this is a blood smear from somebody with sickle cell anemia. So is this. These are sickle cells. That's a normal biconcave disc of a normal-looking uh, uh, red blood cell. And you see these cells in patients with sickle cell anemia. And, but if you think about it, when you make a blood smear, it's sitting out there in normal oxygen tension. This hemoglobin should have be fully loaded with oxygen. Why is it still in a sickle shape? These are what's called irreversibly sickled cells. They've gone back and forth so many times that they can't pack back to the normal shape. You never see that in a normal individual. Uh, if you look at, uh, if you do what is not done anymore, in the old days you used to do something called a sickle prep where you would take the red blood cells and put it under a cover slip and put in a chemical that removed all the oxygen. In someone with sickle cell anemia, every cell becomes sickle. Even in people with trait, some of the cells would sickle. And we don't diagnose this that way. OK, so what happens if you have sickle cell anemia? Well, uh, all the places where the oxygen tension is very low or red cells tend to sit around for a long time or it's an acidic environment, these are all things that favor that sickling. You get into trouble. And the spleen is one of those places. And children with sickle cell anemia almost all end up infarcting and totally destroying their spleen uh, in early childhood. It's called autosplenectomy. You can live without a spleen. It's not the end of the world. But it does leave you susceptible to particular kinds of infection. And that's at least part of uh, one of the major issues and one of the major causes of death of sickle cell anemia, which are particular types of infection, particularly encapsulated organisms like pneumococcus. All these people should get pneumococcal vaccine very young. Um, and several other bacteria that are particularly common. It's not that they're more susceptible to get the infection, but if they do, it can spread suddenly and dramatically uh, uh, much more uh, 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 lethally than it would in someone who, who didn't have sickle cell anemia. The major hallmark are these painful crises, vaso-occlusion, typically in blood vessels in the bone, and they get severe pain, uh, and they're profoundly uh, disabling. Uh, uh, and it can lead to some damage to, to the bones. Uh, stroke is a big issue. Again, vaso-occlusion in a blood vessel to the brain. 
Some people get them, some don't. Not well understood, probably other genetic factors. Acute chest syndrome, these are all uh, 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 aspects of the disease. Um, and with advancing age, chronic damage to lots of organs from this repeated process. Well, as I mentioned, sickle cell, uh, th that allele is extremely common in, uh, in Africa. Uh, and I'll show you that in more detail in a second. In a and Americans of African uh, uh, descent, uh, about 8% or so of the population are carriers of sickle cell anemia. Uh, that means of all the sickle cell, of all the hemoglobin beta alleles in this population, about 4% of them are sickle and 96% are normal. Since you have two alleles, uh, you know, either one could be sickle to be a carrier. About 8% of people end up being carrier. Well, if 4% of the alleles have this, the chance of getting two of those alleles is 4% or times 4%, or roughly 0.16% should have sickle cell anemia. And guess what? That's exactly. So this is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, which I think you've heard about, right? No, not, didn't, you, didn't Dr. Glare talk about that yet, or am I? Next, OK. You'll remember that. It'll come back to you. Um, uh, hemoglobin C is rarer, uh, about 1.5% allele frequency or 3% of the population have it. And it turns out that having sickle C, having one of each, is almost as common as a sickle cell, somewhat less. Now, we already mentioned this point earlier. Uh, when does a child with sickle cell anemia run into trouble? Are you going to see a sickle cell crisis in a newborn? No, because they've still got all their fetal hemoglobin. They're fine. And as we'll mention in a second, Fetal hemoglobin, if you have some of that around, it remarkably inhibits this sickling process. So even a few percent of fetal hemoglobin is very protective. And a lot of our therapies actually aimed around trying to increase the amount of fetal hemoglobin. And if you could increase fetal hemoglobin, you'll, you'll eliminate the sickling problem. So these kids don't run into problems till really after a year or so in age. The fetal hemoglobin has really gotten to the baseline. Uh, I mentioned this already, but this disease is incredibly common in Africa, and a remarkably instructive observation that was made many years ago, and we're going to come back to this in, in uh, later lectures. Um, it turns out that the sickle mutation, this single nucleotide change, has happened four times in human evolution. Four different individuals throughout human history acquired this mutation. Of the 70 new mutations we each got in those four people, one of them was this particular DNA change. And they occurred, the chromosome they occurred on, we can still see a signature of. We're going to come back to this point in more detail later. Uh, but if we look at the various variations, normal variations along the, the chromosome, in everybody with sickle, they have one of four types of uh, sickle. It's the same nucleotide change in codon 6, but all the region around there, there are four flavors. And if you look at their prevalence in Africa, you can see type 1 is concentrated here, type 2 here, and most concentrated here, type 3 here, most concentrated here, and there's uh, this fourth type, which is called uh, SS Arab, which is actually found in the Middle East. And what you're actually looking at is probably where that individual who had that mutation lived. Uh, and you're looking at migration of their uh, uh, successors in these various regions. Uh, in the world. And everyone who has sickle cell anemia uh, today uh, inherited it from one of those original founders probably 50,000 some odd years ago. And we'll come talk more about how we know that. Okay, I mentioned this, this you're seeing here in pink where malaria is a big problem. And in hatching this way is the, where the sickle cell gene is prevalent. Hatching this way where beta thalassemia gene is prevalent. And you can see both beta thalassemia and sickle cell anemia overlay like the alpha thalassemia story I showed you pretty well with malaria. So the, we're all pretty convinced in the genetics world that malaria has been the selective pressure. The advantage for the heterozygote is what has kept this so common. Uh, how do we treat these patients? Nothing you need to know now. You're going to learn this later in medical school. You will all see patients with sickle cell anemia. It's a very common disease. And the treatment is limited. Uh, and again, I think profoundly embarrassing and humbling to us as physicians that we haven't been able to do better. A lot of it is just supportive, giving them fluids, giving them pain relief. We do a terrible job of providing uh, pain relief for these patients, um, a shameful job, really. Uh, treating their infections promptly, prophylactically in many cases. Uh, transfusion, sometimes we do too much of that. You want to do this, that as little. Sometimes you have to. 
uh, but uh, there are problems with transfusions. And these are become the mainstay of treatment. There's a chemotherapy drug called hydroxyurea, a little counterintuitive. It slightly damages the bone marrow, but the bone marrow's response, it makes a little more fetal hemoglobin. And so these red cells now have a little more fetal hemoglobin and it, it dramatically decreases many of the complications of sickle cell. And it's sort of a balance, is it worth it or not? But many patients with sickle, particularly those who've had any serious complications, are on hydroxyurea. And finally, bone marrow transplant. We give them a bone marrow, which is where all the red cells come from. We give them a normal bone marrow from a normal person, uh, then that's the cure of the sickle cell anemia. Problem is, bone marrow transplants come at a very high price. Maybe a third of the patients who are going to have very serious complications or die from the transplant. You have to trade that off against the disease where many patients do just fine for, for reasonable long lives. And when do you do it? When don't you? Uh, and uh, it's, it's, if transplant ever becomes completely safe, everyone will get transplanted and cured. Okay. So at the end of that section, I'm going to move on now to the DNA sequence variation. Yes? Yeah, I didn't really uh, uh, say much about that. There are patients who have two copies of hemoglobin C, fairly rare. It's mainly a, 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 a fine points for hematologists. The red cells look a little different. They have some of the same problems that sickle patients have. More common is individuals with one S and one C. Looks a lot like sickle cell anemia. It's called hemoglobin SC disease, but it's for all intents and purposes, you treat it and deal with it the same way you do sickle cell anemia. Um, they have certain minor differences. They get a retinopathy more commonly than SS disease, but by and large, uh, uh, it, it's a fairly similar.